Ladies and gentlemen, when we hear of an audit, we tend to think of financial accounts and we start listening to hear who is guilty of fraud or some other misconduct. True? Well, a transfusion audit is quite similar to a financial audit, except that it examines the use of blood and blood products in the practice of transfusion rather than the use of money and its various instruments in the practice of business. But an audit is not designed to find anyone guilty of misconduct. It is not a witch hunt. A transfusion audit is an official examination of the practice of blood transfusion and its related processes and activities. In fact, a transfusion audit is a quality improvement process designed and implemented to improve patient care and outcomes. The purpose of the transfusion audit is threefold. It is to establish a uniform standard of transfusion practice throughout the hospital. And if there are guidelines, whether they're local, national, or international, um, these help to keep the practice of transfusion standard and also the audit will see whether the practice is complying with the particular standards being used. Of course, if the same guidelines are being followed in all hospitals, then there should be eventually a uniform standard of practice throughout hospitals. The second purpose of the transfusion audit is to identify inappropriate practices and events. Sometimes what is identified seems small and insignificant, and we are tempted to let it slide. But ignoring the issue could have a disastrous effect on patient outcome. One example that comes to mind is a case many years ago of a mother and daughter who were admitted to hospital following a motor vehicle accident. Both patients had sustained multiple fractures and needed to be taken to the operating theater. Samples were submitted to the blood bank and blood was subsequently issued for the mother. Mother was transfused, her condition worsened and she died two days after transfusion. What happened? Um, the samples were submitted to the, to the laboratory with names only. In fact, the names used on the samples were not the correct names of the patient. Somehow the doctor making the requisition had managed to give both patients the same first and last name and one of them had a middle name. So during the course of the night when blood was asked for, for the mother and the first, middle and last name were quoted and the clinical staff agreed that that's the patient they wanted. Blood was issued, blood was transfused but lo and behold, the patient was actually being transfused from the other patient sample. Of course, what ensued was unavoidable because people, was, people were not paying attention. Um, staff in the operating theater admitted to having seen certain changes in the patient but because the patient was not complaining and this patient was under anesthesia, um, 
But um, there was some evidence of uh, the patient becoming jaundice, and they chose to ignore it. They thought it wasn't particularly important. And it wasn't discovered until late the following day that the error had occurred. By that time, it was much too late, and the patient passed. So the small audit, which was conducted afterwards, helped to discover what the problems were and some measures were put in place at that time to prevent the same thing from happening again. And so we find these days, um, most doctors will give us, along with the patient's name, a docket number, medical records number that would help to say, this is indeed John Brown or Mary Jane and the sample does belong to John Brown or Mary Jane. The third purpose of the transfusion audit is to monitor the therapeutic and adverse effects of transfusion. Very often we think of the transfusion outcome in terms of an increase in hemoglobin levels or platelet counts or the correction of the PT, PTT or INR and we are not so concerned about the other outcomes that might show themselves up later on. But there are things that can happen later on, long afterwards, and so the transfused patient needs to be monitored for an extended period post-transfusion. So we've looked at the threefold purpose of the transfusion audit, to establish a, uni a uniform standard of transfusion practice, to identify and correct inappropriate practices and events, and to monitor therapeutic and adverse effects of each transfusion. To achieve this purpose, the audit looks in details at the decision-making process leading up to the actual transfusion. It looks at the clinical indications for the transfusion, and these were called transfusion triggers. This obviously includes the clinical signs and symptoms, laboratory findings, and anticipated effects of planned procedures. It seeks to answer questions such as is there significant pallor? Is there shortness of breath? Do we have tachycardia? Is there any underlying condition? Do we have sepsis, sickle cell, leukemia, renal impairment? Is the patient bleeding? Is the patient expected to bleed? How much blood loss are we expecting? Um, these are just a few of the questions that may be asked in making the decision to transfuse. Once the decision is made to transfuse, then decisions must also be made about the right component um, and the right amount to be used. And you heard Dr. Taylor speak earlier on about the significance of each component and what conditions they are relevant for. And so I need not go too much into that. Um, but just to revise that, is there a need for increased oxygen carrying capacity or red cell mass? Then you're going to give back cells. Is the patient bleeding? Do you anticipate bleeding because of a low platelet count or impaired platelet function? Then we're going to give platelets. Um, other things, does the patient have a hereditary dysfunction of factor eight or something, do we need to give cryo? Those are decisions that need to be made. And then there are other things like how fast we're gonna run the transfusion. Um, do we need to use a pressure pump to give the blood? Are we gonna use a blood warmer? That sort of thing. The transfusion audit also looks at the vital signs before the start of the transfusion. At intervals during the transfusion and at the end of the transfusion. 
in order to assess the outcome. We have a slide here that asks, did you check the doctor's orders? Did you check the patient's ID? Did you check the blood with another qualified person? Did you follow the institution's policy? Did you check the patient's history for compatibility, previous transfusions, previous reactions? Did you do any patient education? But well, all of that is important, and all of that information will be recalled during an audit. The clinical outcome is always assessed by looking again at the vital signs. Any changes or improvement in the clinical signs and symptoms, and any, ad any evidence of adverse reactions, and of course, post-transfusion laboratory findings. Although we try to make the blood supply as safe as possible, I am sure we are all aware of the possibility of transmission of certain infectious diseases during transfusion. With this in mind, the transfused patient needs to be monitored for signs of any development of infectious diseases that may be related to the transfused blood, and appropriate investigations should be done. <clears throat> there is other information that can be recalled through an audit, and it looks at how the blood is transported once it leaves the blood bank, how long is it kept out of the bank, out of the blood bank, um, between being taken from the blood bank until it arrives on the ward. And some of us who work in the system know very well that the blood could be collected and somebody could take it to lunch with them and come back and that sort of thing. So the, the audit seeks to um, pull out all that information and use the information to improve eventually patient care and patient outcome. Other things could also come out of the audit and this include um, what is the average number of units being used for certain surgical procedures, how many uncross-matched um, transfusions are we doing, how many non-group transfusions are being done, that sort of thing. Um, now, I've been speaking as if the audit is always something that follows the transfusion process, um, as if it's being done concurrently. But it, it's usually done retrospectively. That's the easiest way but it can also be done concurrently, can be done, um, can be done retrospectively, concurrently, or prospectively, depending on what is convenient or what is important at the time. The important thing is to get it done. Um, and once the audit is done, it is important that a report be prepared and we don't just stuff the information in somebody's desk drawer or in a folder on top of somebody's desk. But the information must be put in a proper report and submitted to the hospital transfusion committee so that it can be discussed in a meaningful way and that measures can be developed to improve the practice of transfusion. I thank you.